Today on Straight Talk Africa, Bobby Wine, a major Ugandan artist turned politician and lawmaker, has been released on bail. He is a prominent critic of President Yoweri Museveni, and his message of change has drawn traction among Ugandans at home and abroad. Could Bobby Wine be a game changer in Ugandan politics? We'll also talk about the significance of the death of an African legend, the first black UN Secretary General, Kofi Annan. That's coming up next right here on Straight Talk Africa. Hello, welcome to Straight Talk Africa, live from the Voice of America headquarters here in Washington. I am Sheka Sali. And today, it's a discussion on why Bobby Wine's message for change is drawing traction among Ugandans at home and abroad, and the international community. And we also pay a tribute to an African legend, the late Kofi Annan, who was the first black United Nations Secretary General. This is a, this is a message to the government. Expressing what's exactly on the people's mind. I say we are fighting for freedom. Yo, we are living in a time similar to the one of slave trade. This the relics are from Bobby Wine's a hit song of freedom. His ability to use music to rally young people around social causes is remarkable. Since his election to parliament last year in June, Bobby Wine has been a thorn in the side of President Museveni's ruling party, the NRM. While appearing on Straight Talk Africa earlier this year, Bobby Wine spoke about the Uganda he aspires to live in. When someone decides to become a president or to run for president or whatever it is, surely they must believe in something. Yeah. They probably must have the vision thing. What is your vision, for example, for Uganda? Well, I'm looking at a Uganda that is ruled by social justice, by equal rights, by rule of law where everybody is equal before and under the law, where everybody can live to their full potential, where if you work hard, you are sure you're going to succeed. That is the kind of Uganda that I envision. In his newfound role as a significant voice of Uganda's youth, Wine's songs are critical of the government. Twelve applicants, their applications for bail is allowed. A judge released Robert Chagulani Sentamu alongside others in the northern Ugandan town of Gulu on Monday who are similarly charged with prison for their alleged roles in an incident in which the presidential motorcade was pelted with stones. He was initially charged before a military court martial with illegal possession of firearms and ammunition. Those charges were later dropped and he was taken to a civilian court where he was charged with prison. In recent days, Uganda's government had faced mounting pressure at home and abroad at release Bobby Wine. Across social media, the hashtag of free Bobby Wine has been widely used to call for his release. In Nairobi, artist Swift Nine Graffiti added his voice with a mural of Chagulani on the backdrop of the city skyline. Human rights activists are calling for the Ugandan government to explain pictures and reports of brutal torture of legislators by security forces who have violently put down street protests demanding his release. President Yoweri Museveni, a Western ally on regional security, took power by force in 1986 and has since been elected five times. The 74-year-old leader is now able to seek re-election in 2021 because the Ugandan parliament passed a legislation last year removing a clause in the constitution that had prevented anyone over 75 from holding the presidency.
Meanwhile, the world is continuing to mourn the death of former United Nations Secretary General Kofi Annan, who died on Saturday, August 18th at 80 years old, after a short illness. A statement released by the United Nations said, quote, We mourn the loss of a great man, a leader and a visionary, a life well lived. A life worth celebrating. Born in Ghana, Annan was the first black African to head the United Nations, serving as its leader from 1997 to 2006. As Secretary General, Annan was instrumental in creating the Global Fund to fight AIDS, tuberculosis, and malaria. Kofi Annan is also credited for saving Kenya from joining a list of failed states in Africa after he mediated the peace talks which ended the post-election violence following the disputed and discredited December 27, 2007 elections in Kenya. Paul Diho, VOA News, Washington. Thanks, Paul, for that report. And joining us today are two distinguished guests, Dr. Daniel Kauma. Chairman of the Uganda Diaspora Investment Company, USA, and Jeffrey Smith, Executive Director, Vanguard Africa, a pro-democracy NGO that advocates for free and fair elections and respect for fundamental human rights in Africa. We also invited Ambassador Mar Sebuja Katende, the head of the Ugandan mission to the United States, but due to a scheduling conflict, he was not able to join us. Well, I have to say frankly that uh, I am profoundly honored and exceedingly humbled to have the opportunity to host you in Washington for the first time on Straight Talk Africa. It's a pleasure. Thank you. You're most welcome. And we are joining us uh, from New York uh, is uh, Stefani Dujaric former spokesman for UN Secretary General Kofi Annan, and now a current UN spokesperson. He joins us, of course, uh, from the UN headquarters in Manhattan. Good afternoon, uh, Stefani. Good afternoon. How are you? Very well, thank you. It's great to be on, on, on your show. It's a pleasure to host you for the first time uh, on Straight Talk Africa, Stefani. Stefani, you worked for the late um, UN Secretary General Kofi Annan. What kind of person was Kofi Annan, very, very briefly? Personally, to me, he was a wonderful boss. He was a, uh, he was a profoundly good man. Uh, I think I, I speak for a lot of current UN staffers and former UN staffers who say they, they was real, we had real pride in, uh, in working for him uh, as Secretary General. I think he, one of the legacies that he will leave is how he opened the United Nations up to voices, to civil society, to the business community, to people whose voices had not been heard within the halls of the United Nations. And he truly brought this organization into the 21st century. How do you respond to some critics who say that uh, he actually was able to get that job well, precisely, these are their words, not mine, uh, precisely because he really was a very malleable individual, that he was very, very different from the man he succeeded, Dr. Boutros, Boutros Gari. Look, every secretary general is different. They are elected. Uh, first and foremost by the Security Council, which because uh, the five permanent members can, can veto them, and then the General Assembly. So that's just a, a fact. I think, you know, during his 10 years, uh, he suffered from criticism from, from all, from different sides. Some people accused him of being too passive. Others accused him of being too active. I think you just need to take a look at the press coverage at the beginning, the middle, and the end of his term. Uh, the point is that any Secretary General has to navigate the will and the needs of 193 member states. And that's always a challenge. Uh, you know, Kofi Annan used to joke that Secretary General SG, as he is called, really stands for scapegoat. 
Uh, and he, he went with it. And I think he never, the one thing he never gave up on is trying to implement the ideals that are found in the Charter of the United Nations. There's a saying, of course, that um, as a UN Secretary General, um, there are times when uh, you may have uh, to act as a secretary, and there are other times when uh, it might be necessary for you to be a general. Uh, what kind of secretary general was he? Was he the kind of guy that uh, was a secretary or a general or a combination of both? He, he was both. He did, he did his job to the best of his ability. If you'll recall, in the run-up to the Iraq conflict, he did whatever he could to ensure that to try to make sure that conflict would be avoided, that resolutions would be accept, uh, implemented. What he wanted was a respect for the international rule of law, a respect for the resolutions of the Security Council. We know what happened. Uh, he tried to defend the charter. Uh, some member states went ahead uh, with the invasion of Iraq. But in the end, he didn't give up on the Iraqi people. He didn't walk away uh, from the Iraqi people. After the, the main of the bulk of the fighting was over, the United Nations returned to Iraq to help with the transition to democracy, to elections, and paying a very high price for it. When uh, 15 years ago last week, uh, we lost uh, 23 of our, of our close comrades in a, in a terrorist attack. I think, you know, he, he never, never gave up. And I, I think that's how he, we want to remember him as a man who never gave up on this, on this institution, uh, which this institution which is meant to bring all 193 member states together and which is never easy. It is one of the most impossible jobs on earth. If you were to put your fingers on it, uh, uh, what would you say was uh, perhaps uh, uh, the single most important decision that he made during his tenure? And what about uh, the single most regrettable decision? You know, I, I, don't, I, I don't want to engage in that because I think the decisions depend on, you know, if, on who they impact. And for all the people that have been impacted, those decisions are important. I think he, he led what was the first really gotcha. review of the UN's actions in Srebrenica and in Rwanda. He was not afraid to have people cast a critical look on the organization to see how it could improve, how it could do uh, better. I think one of the most, uh, you know, a number of the important things he did was to usher in the Millennium Development Goals. The first time the international community came and, and to bring about a roadmap for development to impact everybody on a positive side. The responsibility to protect was also passed under his, uh, his mandate. And I think what your reporter mentioned in his report, how he brought the business community, the NGOs and member states together to fight the spread of AIDS. And I think that was a very, it was a successful turnaround from where, where we were at the time. He talked very much about uh, reform, UN reform, the need for UN reform, uh, especially the fact that uh, when you look at uh, the UN Security Council, it is not democratic. Uh, how far did he go in that direction? Well, he, he like, I think like most secretaries general, he, he understood the need for the reform of the Security Council, for Security Council to be a reflection of the world that it is now as opposed to the world that it is in 1945. But the decision, the power to reform the Security Council rests in the hands of member states. It is not something that the Secretary General can order uh, with the wave of a wand. It's a change in the Constitution, in the Charter of the United Nations, and that's something that member states need to do. But I think he, he understood that the legitimacy of the United Nations not only passed through reform of the Security Council, but also to make sure that everyone's voice was heard at the UN. And I think NGOs, civil society, uh, for the first, you know, for, had a much greater voice uh, thanks to the efforts uh, that he put in, and that those efforts continue to pay off today. Your current boss, the UN uh, Secretary General, uh, Mr. Guterres, has described or characterized uh, um, Kofi Annan as the UN, as the UN itself. What does that yes, it, exactly it, it, mean? It, well, it, it means that, you know, for Kofi Annan, his entire 
just about his entire professional career was spent within the UN system. He was a product of the system. He understood the UN, and that's why he really embodied the UN when he was Secretary General. I mean, he is, his, his professional career is, cannot be uh, dissolved from the United Nations. And I think that's what uh, Antonio Guterres meant when he said in many ways he, he was the United Nations when Mr. Guterres paid tribute to Mr. Anand uh, after his death. On that note, um, Stefani Dujaric, uh, for, uh, former spokesperson for UN Secretary General Kofi Annan, thank you so much, so much for sharing that information with us. Thank you very much, and, and thank, you, thank you for having me on the show. You're most welcome, and of course, come again. Will do. Take care. Thank you. You too. Yes, and um, joining us uh, from uh, the Ugandan capital, Kampala, is Mildred Tuhaise, a senior reporter with NBS television, uh, Ugandan independent television station. Good evening, uh, Ms. Tuhaise. Good evening, Saka. How are you? I'm well, fine, thanks. How are you? I am terrific. Uh, talk to us about the mood in Kampala. Well, the mood Saka right now, I can authoritatively say, is much calmer than the mood that was in Kampala the days when um, Honorable Chagulani and the 33 others were still detained, and the days when we were still waking up to hear uh, what would be coming in from the court. But the court martial, which earlier on, um, we had charges, Honorable Bobby Wine and Sir, charges of uh, illegal possession of ammunition, and then later on when the court did drop his charges to when he was taken to the civilian court, uh, it was a state court formation, of course. Uh, the case is still on and pending. The case in that was filed in the Gulu High Court. And on Monday, this very week, um, uh, seven days later, later, and the traffic others were released in an uncashed bail of um, five million, and for their surety, ten million uncashed bail. Talk to us about Monday, Mildred. Uh, what was the reaction like uh, when uh, they heard, for example, that uh, Bobby Wine had actually been released on bail? Well, well, well. I think starting off from Gulu, the live pictures that were coming in with our reporters on ground, it was a jovial mode. It was celebration mode, uh, not only in Gulu, actually, but also in Aroa, because the MP elect who is Cassiano Adri, who fortunately uh, was sworn in today as a speaker's chamber by the clerk to parliament, uh, had never, because he did win the election uh, under incarceration, and he was in Gulu, that's where he was detained, and won the election in Arua. So there was celebration uh, of a big temporary freedom, although it's announced that he's been banished to support for three months from, you know, heading anywhere near Arua. It was a celebration right there, and if he has to go there, he has to seek confirmation. Coming back to Bulu, there were fans of Bobby Wine, or he is suddenly legislated, but commonly known as Bobby Wine. It was celebratory mode, um, and there were lots of uh, chants, people chanting, people power, our power. This is the slogan, of course, of the people power uh, kind of um, group. And then back in Kampala, I particularly, personally witnessed celebrations in um, the ghettos here, and particularly in an area called uh, Kamocha, uh, there were celebrations thrown. There were speakers, the flyers of Bobby Wine, and uh, they were celebrating. It was actually a trans night sort of a party for the people here who were celebrating um, the temporary freedom of Southern Race Legislature and the other party here, of course. Now, Mildred, you mentioned that uh, Cassian uh, Wadley has actually been uh, uh, Sony in as a member of parliament uh, representing Aruba, and yet he yes, is yes. not allowed to step foot in Aruba. Is there some sort of or some kind of martial law in Aruba? Well, um, while appearing before the Gulu High, of course, prosecution raised the concern that uh, probably the to Arua, he would be involved in illegal processions, or there would be a little bit of chaos because his people haven't seen him from the time that he was elected into that particular position. So, because of the 
concerns that was raised by prosecution. Um, they asked that he appeal, and then uh, the, the, the presiding judge actually asked up until when, because also the defense lawyers were concerned how much time, because it seems to be an ambiguous time. And then the presiding judge did indicate that it would only be three months, but also cited that in case it was urgent, that he definitely needs to go to Arua, then he would have to seek court permission and uh, see how security can help him access the area. Because also uh, the defense lawyer did cite out that if in case it is an, an, an system or an issue of gathering that is uh, catered for under the Public Order Management Act of Uganda, so uh, that needed not to be an issue to prevent him from going there. That court remains stunned that he is given three as we talk, uh, Mildred, where is uh, Bobby Wine and his colleagues? Uh, we get, of course, that uh, they are expected to report to the courts in Arua on Thursday. Yes, exactly. They are expected to report to the courts, but currently, Honorable Chabilani Center Morrison, known as Bobby Wine, is uh, receiving treatment under Rubaka Hospital because it was very urgent that he needed medical attention, because even in the courtroom, he looked very frail. He could not he could uh, not sit for a very long time. Actually, in the courtroom, there are uh, the accused, uh, the two accused persons who collapsed uh, due to, you know, their uh, health status right there. So he's receiving um, um, a treatment in Rubaba Hospital. And for a member of parliament like Atiano Adri, who didn't receive really uh, very grave injuries, he, um, he was wanting to get like a one, and he left his home. We actually spoke here uh, to him today morning on, on the morning show, Morning Breeze, and he seemed to be very, very jovial and in a very happy mood. Same as other members of parliament, because other members of parliament like Daryl Karang and Tunga Municipality Representative is as well fine. He's at his home. Uh, Katiana Wadri, like I said earlier, Paul Moiro as well, Ginger Ipe, had um, a little bit of issues with his hand. But he's well, they're all in their homes, aside from uh, one of the children who is still taking medication. And the other accused who are still taking a medication in their other areas. Well, on that note, uh, Amot Mildred Tuhaise, thank you so much mm -hmm. for sharing mm -hmm. your insight with us. You're welcome, Saka. Thank you for having me. It's a pleasure. Let me come to you, uh, um, Daniel Kauma. What about uh, from your vantage point? You belong to the Ugandan diaspora. Yes. How does the developments? How do the developments in Uganda really look like to you? From our perspective, as Ugandans in the diaspora, first of all, I want to slide back a little bit to see why we have Bobby Wine as an individual. I think it's very important not to ignore the demographic changes that are happening in our country and even not only back home, but also in the diaspora. Mm -hmm. Uganda at the moment, 55% of our population is under the age of 18. 70% of our population is under the age of 30. So we have a large young population of youth mm -hmm. who are on the streets. Mm -hmm. um, the level of education is not sufficient. They are not well trained, not well equipped to be in the labor force at the moment. So they are languishing in Kamocha, in Kasangati, in Natete, on the streets of Kampala. Mm. So these young people are looking for an answer. They are looking for a solution. So at the moment, in any country, such a young population will be an asset. When you have a large segment of the population entering the labor force, that's typically an asset in any country because you have a large tax-paying base. Most of the countries in Europe are struggling with a larger, older segment of the population. So for us, Uganda, we have a large population of youth. But the problem is that the youth are unemployed. Unemployed. It, so it, it, what would have been an asset is becoming a liability for the country. And those are the people who are looking to the government for answers. And the only person offering them answers and hope at the moment is not our incumbent government, which has been in power for 30 years. They look at a 74-year-old president, Mr. Museveni. 32, and then they perhaps, look, about 32. Yeah, exactly. And then they look at Mr. Chagulani, Bobby Wine, who is 36, who is our age. They, he relates more to them. He understands their struggles. He walks on the same streets. 
He goes to actually to the little stores and little supermarkets where they shop, where they sell their goods. So Chagulani to them exemplifies what they are going through, what their experiences are. So as Ugandans in the diaspora, most of us who come here are also coming out of that environment, looking for opportunities. So there's a connection between what's happening in Uganda and the people who end up flocking to the embassy to get visas to come to the diaspora. It's because we are looking for opportunity. Mm. So the same answers, those who can't get visas are looking to Chagulani to offer the answers and leaders like him, us are trying to find an exit strategy. Where can we find greener pastures? So at the moment, the Minister of Foreign Affairs estimates there's 1.5 million Ugandans in the diaspora. 1.5 and growing. So that means that there is a desire for opportunity. Most Ugandans who live and come to the diaspora, they don't want to necessarily live here. But if those opportunities could be created in our country, we would rather be here. So when we see it, an individual like Cha Gulani who offers hope to our country, going through the same treatment that we have seen opposition leaders like Kanokiza Besige experience, we have to stand up and say, no, we cannot allow our country to go through the same phase which we have seen happen before. So Chagulanyi, the reason why you have Ugandans in Boston, Ugandans here in DC, Ugandans in London, Toronto marching on the streets, it's not because we want to taint the image of our country, but it's because we don't want our country to damage our future, future leaders like Chagulanyi and others. So that's why, as a diaspora, you saw us in DC here marching, you are seeing others in Boston speaking up, because we think our country has gone through this before. We know our history clearly. We know where Uganda has been since independence. We have never had peaceful power change in our country between different presidents. It has always been violent, and we don't want to go back. So we want a future which is more democratic. We want a future of leaders who are inspiring young people like Chagulanyi, mm -hmm. not only through his deeds, but his music, which is a key part of who he is. He sings about the struggles of the average Ugandan on the streets, and they relate to that. I see. That's why they call him the ghetto president. He's the man who is fighting for the poor. We'll come to you uh, a little bit later. Let me come to you, Jeff. What about you from your vantage point? Uh, what do you read out of this? Uh, you know, Daniel rightly talks about uh, the changing demographics, and yeah. probably he might also have added that uh, these changing demographics in tandem with the social media could probably be a democratic game changer on the continent. Yeah, absolutely. I th and I think to, to sort of broaden Daniel's point out a bit, if you look across the entire continent, I don't think what we're seeing happening in Uganda is by any means uh, an isolated incident, right? Uh, if you look at the average age um, across sub-Saharan Africa, it's 19 years old. The average age of those in power is 62 years old. So there's a vast chasm between the up-and-coming youth generation and those leaders who've been in power, like Museveni, who's been there for 32 years, or Paul Bia in Cameroon, who's been in power since 1982. Um, and, and there's no shortage of those. Um, Uganda, I think it's particularly acute. The average age is 16 and a half years old. Um, they, they've never known another leader uh, besides uh, Yuwari Museveni. Um, and to your point uh, about the use of social media, I think in this particular instance, as well as others, it's been truly uh, remarkable and, and a real game changer. I think when you look uh, at the outcry about uh, Bobby Wine's um, uh, unjust attention, the torture that he um, was the recipient of on behalf of the authorities, you, you saw a global outcry uh, across uh, social media, across traditional media. Um, and if you look at the, a lot of the social media traffic, a lot of it was being generated across the Eastern Horn of Africa, much of it coming from Kenya. Um, you saw the Africans Rising uh, Collective, which is very active in West and Central Africa and Francophone Africa, mm -hmm. really helping to elevate the cause. And not only Bobby Wine, but you started to see sort of other spin-off um, initiatives where uh, Free Diane Raguara, who's, who's currently detained for now one year um, as of today in, in Rwanda. So it's, I think it's really galvanized a lot of people across the globe because to Daniel's point, he speaks to a much broader audience than someone like a President Museveni can ever hope to speak to. Well, I have to say, time is not a best ally, but we'll come back to that and more later. You're tuned in to Straight Talk Africa. We'll have more of a discussion in a moment, so please don't go away.
Like Voice of America on Facebook. Follow VOA on Twitter. Join VOA on our YouTube channel. Like, follow, join VOA. Today's youth are not just the next generation of African leaders, they are today's leaders. And this is the time to invest in them. Today, not tomorrow. So let's connect, let's engage with each other on issues that will transform our societies. Innovation, leadership, entrepreneurship, things that you're doing to move the continent forward to make you the greatest generation that Africa has known. It's up front every Wednesday, 1730 UTC, right here on The Voice of America. Jeff, I'm sorry that um, I had to interrupt because uh, in this studio there is no democracy. <laughs> when uh, the producer general says go for the break, you have to go. So uh, I so hope you'll find some space in defer. a beautiful American yeah. heart to forgive me for that. Always. Thank you very much. <laughs> now, Jeff, uh, uh, when you come to African culture, there is this thing called authority mm -hmm. rather than reasoning. Authority meaning uh, the older you are, the wiser you are. Right. Uh, the more uh, highly uh, placed you are, the more smarter you are, and all that kind of stuff. Are you seeing some fundamental changes of attitudes and mindsets mm -hmm. among the ordinary, average African youth? I, you know, and from my perspective, I, I really think you are. I think uh, if you look across the continent and a lot of the um, popular protests that are happening, um, across the continent. They're being, being driven by youth and they're being mobilized um, by online and social and, and digital media, which is why I think you're starting to see a counter trend of those in power trying to clamp down on, on social media. You, you see it happening in Uganda, for instance, with the social media mm. tax. Mm. Uh, you see it happening uh, in, in Zambia, of all places. And particularly around election times, it's becoming the norm now where governments shut down social media. So people cannot organize and they can't mobilize um, online or in the public square. Um, but I think going back to the, the larger trend um, that we're seeing, uh, particularly in Uganda, again, I, the, the, the current ordeal that we're seeing with, with, with what happened in Arua, it's, it's not an isolated incident. Going back to uh, 2012, I believe, when MP Sarana Nabanda was poisoned under mysterious circumstances. Um, Daniel mentioned the, the continuing trials and tribulations uh, of Kiza Besije. Um, in September of 2017, when you had Uganda's security forces raid the parliament um, and, and nearly beat to an inch of her life uh, another uh, member of parliament, um, uh, Betty Nambuze, who's, who I believe um, has been laid up in the hospital due to damage to her Nambuze spine. Nambuze from Mukono. Exactly. So this sort of state-sponsored, politically motivated brutality has been happening for 32 years in Uganda. But I think, again, to Daniel's point and to, and to the issues you brought up, the rising youth population, um, the, the solidarity that is being built uh, across borders and across boundaries, uh, across East Africa, Long across the continent. Internationally. Exactly, and the diaspora, people like Daniel. I think, and, and I feel very comfortable sitting here today and saying that if it wasn't for that global outcry and if it wasn't for people like Daniel and others in the diaspora and those in the country and the brave, courageous activists on the ground raising this to, to a global level, Bobby Wine would still be behind right. bars. There's no doubt in my mind. So I think um, we need to keep activating, we need to keep mobilizing, and we need to keep shining a light on dictators. Because what happens uh, in Uganda and elsewhere is, you know, oftentimes uh, abusive leaders are able to get away with what they do, mm. overstepping um, their powers in, or, or instituting uh, harshly repressive or retrograde laws because no one's paying attention and no one's talking about it. And I think the more light we can shine on that, um, the, the, the better it is um, for everybody, the better it is for democratic rights, and the better it is um, for, for the future, not only of Uganda, but, but of the entire continent as well. Very interesting. Uh, Daniel, what about uh, supporters of Yoweri Museveni? who say that uh, in Museveni, you're looking at um, a uniquely gifted leader. Right. Something perhaps akin to really, uh, you know, like uh, essentially something that is very rarely seen in society. Right. We're talking about something akin to perhaps 
God is a political gift mm. to Uganda. Right. But we have seen that before, not just in Uganda, where we have strong men who rule a country for decades. We saw that in Libya. We have seen that in Egypt. You uh, saw that uh, in uh, Zimbabwe, where I just came from. Yeah. So we are not saying that Museveni hasn't done any good for our country. But you have to create a culture of power change. We see it here in the United States. Once in a while, you'll get a George Bush. You'll get a Barack Obama. You'll get a Donald Trump. Mm -hmm. And I guarantee you, after eight years, there'll be somebody else, assuming that he doesn't win another term. So having talent doesn't mean that you stay in power for 30 years or 40 years. Mm -hmm. Because mm -hmm. the new ideas start running out. Because I saw our friends in Ethiopia a few months ago when their new prime minister was in Washington, D.C., you see people flying in. Hundreds and thousands of Ethiopians were flying in mm -hmm. because mm -hmm. it's offering them hope. So you always need that new leader who is going to inspire you, who is going to come and just his presence inspire young people to come out. Are you reminded, new ideas. Uh, for example, of younger Yoweri Museveni Absolutely. back in 1986? Yeah. When Museveni came out in 1986 with his 10-point program, people were excited. People came out, they were laying mats on the streets so that the convoys drive through Kampala. We don't see that anymore. Why, why is that so? Is it because perhaps there is now or what some would call a trust deficit? Absolutely. Trust deficit. Yeah. And throughout the year we have seen, first of all, removing gotcha. presidential term limits, mm. and then recently they removed age limits. So even the ideas which Museveni spoke of in 1986 of leaders who overstay in power for a long time, he's now violating the same ideas and values which he was against in 1986. So that's why most of the people, most of us used to support Museveni. I like the ideas, I like the energy, I read his books, saw in the mustard seed. I believed in all the values he stood for in 1986. Most of us were very young. We grew up under Museveni. We liked some of the changes he made through the country. I lived in Mutundo with my grandmother. We didn't have any, they used to bring sugars to LC, mm -hmm. like bags of sacks of sugar. People used to come and line up just to get sugar and soap in the villages. So we didn't have services, we didn't have a good road network, we didn't have... So there's been changes that have happened in the country. But those changes do not imply that block out the young, youthful leaders. So we need the f complete flow of ideas in our country, and that's why Museveni, in spite of the goods he has done, sort of the good things, we need to create a culture of, of our change. Now, Jeff, uh, yeah. there are some people who, again, talk about uh, the trust deficit. Mm -hmm. They argue that uh, when you look at uh, the issue of trust uh, and you associate it with uh, Yoweri Museveni's account, uh, that probably not so many people believe in that because they say, for example, in 2001, here is a man who was very much beloved by majority of Ugandans, and he basically uh, persuaded his supporters uh, to vote for him uh, for what he characterized as uh, the second and last constitutionally allowable term, so that he could accomplish three important things. One was to professionalize the army. Mm -hmm. The second was to secure a regional economic market. And guess what? The third was to choose a successor. <laughs> this was 2021, and today is 2018. Hmm? Yeah, I, I think it's fascinating. And, and you, you brought this up d during the conversation you were just having. If, if you read what he was writing and speaking about in public in 1986, is you know, he, he said very clearly the problem in Africa is leaders who overstay, who overstay their in time power. and power, and here we are 32 years later. But um, he, uh, he, he, he corrected himself later uh, in a BBC interview that actually what he meant was the leaders who stay in power without being democratically elected. Right. And later in Kisumu, uh, in Kenya, he actually said being in power for a very long time is a very good thing. It's a major asset because he has since become an expert in governance. Right. And I think what Museveni and others in the region have done um, a masterful job of doing, to, to be quite honest, often with the um, support uh, of the West and the United States in particular, is portray himself as a bastion of stability in an otherwise unstable, tenuous region. Is right? that true? 
So m my point there is that stability for whom? Who is that stability for? Is it and stability what is the for definition of stability, really? Right. And uh, if you, if you have no, for example, uh, if you have no uh, social economic justice yep. for your people, is that stability, really? No. That's that's a, that's exactly the, the crux of the question. Is you have to ask yourself that: Is it stability for the political opposition who is routinely beaten, jailed, killed, exiled, or disappeared? Is it stability for? Uh, journalists and the press were being savagely beaten by Museveni security forces in the streets of Kampala. Uh, is it stability for our lesbian and gay brothers and sisters in Uganda who are uh, targeted and persecuted on a daily basis due to retrograde laws in the country? Um, is it stability for, for the economic migrants leaving, leaving the country in droves? Uh, my answer w w would be no. And I think, but you see that. You see that with strong men across the continent, these autocrats who sort of embolden themselves and position themselves uh, on the international stage as these somehow arbiters of stability. Um, again, I, I mentioned Paul Bia earlier in Cameroon. Again, he's done a masterful job in Central Africa of, of doing that. And what I think you're starting to he see... He has been in power since 1982. And arguably since 1975 when he was prime minister. When he was prime so, minister under uh, Ahijo. Yeah, but there are yeah. times when uh, he actually goes to Geneva and occupies the entire <laughs> top floor of the Intercontinental yeah. Hotel a recent for four months. Yeah. A recent and guess study, who pays the bill? Yeah, the taxpayers. Very, very poor um, taxpayers. Uh, a recent study, not to di digress too much, but a recent study was recently done that showed that Paul Bia of Cameroon for the past 32 years has spent four and a half years abroad on private trips, all on taxpayer expense. But going back to Uganda really quickly, um, today in, in the Monitor, the Daily Monitor, um, you know, he was quoted as saying, Uganda is, is in poverty because of big-headed citizens. Very interesting. How completely removed can he be from realities on the ground when he has been in power for 32 years and he's blaming the poverty of the country, of which one-third of citizens live in dire poverty, um, on, on them, not on his leadership? But do, do you sincerely believe, uh, if he were to talk to me, uh, Daniel, from the deepest, the better part right. of your Uganda and heart and soul, right. do you sincerely believe that people like Yoweri Museveni or Paul Bia for that matter, or even perhaps even more so, Teodoro Biang of Equatorial Guinea. Right. Do you sincerely think that these people look at their countries as nations where people have eco shares in those republics, or do they in fact look at them as their private farms? I think uh, it's very evident that often the longer you stay in power, the, the more you lose, you become out of touch with the realities of the people. I think when you become locked behind gates for not 10, not 15, not 20, not 30 years, I think the longer they stay in power, the more they lose their, their heart and soul of their nations. So I think most leaders uh, come up with good ideals. So I don't know if it's just a, a craft to just get into power. But as time goes on, we have seen them walk away from the ideals they start with. So I don't want to say that he didn't mean what he said in 1986. He probably came with good intentions to, to change Uganda, to liberate Uganda. Society is not static, it is dynamic. Absolutely. And as time has gone on, we have seen that the quote that absolute power, uh, power corrupts absolutely. It, and it's, absolute it's pretty power much, corrupts absolutely. Yeah, that's, that's really what's happening to our country. And most of us have grown up under the same leader uh, for now 30 years. So it's, it's really, uh, that's why it, the biggest probably loss for us as a country was the amendment of our constitution to remove uh, we'll, term we'll, limits. We'll come back to and that, age uh, limits. Daniel. Unfortunately, yes. the time again is not our best ally. A reminder that we appreciate all of the audience feedback. Straight Talk Africa streams live every Wednesday on Facebook. And you can also watch us live on your mobile device. Just download the VOA mobile app. Now let's look at what's on tap for next week's program. On the next Straight Talk Africa, VOA presents a town hall special introducing members of the Mandela Washington Fellows for Young African Leaders Initiative. This year, to commemorate Nelson Mandela's 100th birthday, the Fellows participated in community service projects and pledged to continue Mandela's legacy. An in-depth discussion with the Yali Fellows on the next Straight Talk Africa. Like Voice of America on Facebook. 
follow VOA on Twitter. Join VOA on our YouTube channel. Like, follow, join VOA. If you like today's show, please write and tell us what you think or give us some suggestions. Be sure to tell us what station you're tuned into. Our address, Straight Talk Africa, Voice of America, 330 Independence Avenue Southwest, Washington, D.C., 20237 USA. Or send us an email at africatv at voanews.com. Log on to our website at voaafrica.com. Or post your comments on Facebook. Keywords, Straight Talk Africa. Thank you very much, Esther Gide, you what? And of course, this is Straight Talk Africa, coming to you live from Washington. Let me come to you again, uh, Daniel, and uh, I hope you again find, uh, uh, you know, some, at least, uh, uh, some sport in your beautiful heart. Forgive me right. for interfering. Right. Um, you know, I just came back from Southern Africa. Right. I went through Zimbabwe, I was there for a couple of weeks, and I was also for a week uh, in Malawi, and I call it beautiful Malawi, mm. a country that uh, as a kid I used to criticize very much uh, via reading Drum Magazine, which was like my Bible, because of the founding president, Dr. Hastings Kamuzu Banda. Mm. But guess what? Um, I had a great opportunity uh, to interact with Malawi's second president, mm. Bakili Mulusi. We had a great time. And this is a man who said, you know, Shaka, when I came into power mm. in the early mid-90s, mm. there are some presidents that I found in the State House. Right. And when I served my two terms and left, they were still in the State House. And I have now been out of office for about 14 years. Mm. They are still in the State House. Right. I honestly do not know what they are looking for because one thing I can tell them, and I have this great interview from him to boot. Right. I can't wait, in fact, to broadcast it. Mm. He said, one thing I can tell my colleagues mm. is that there is life after State House. Right. He said he no longer worries about uh, blood pressure, for example. Mm. Uh, he's a farmer. Right. Uh, he's an elder statesman. Uh, people go there for advice and what have you. He is very comfortable. And as a matter of fact, we walked in his house on a beautiful hill overlooking Blantyre. And I said, it must be very good and feel good to be a former president of a republic. Right. Why is it that uh, some of these people can't take a cue from people like Bakiri Muluzi? It's, it's really, it's hard to tell for the case of Uganda, honestly. I think um, I... Most of us have been debating this for a long time, that is it better to be under the same person, uh, especially our older generation, which is risk averse, our parents and grandparents, they kept bringing up memories of the 80s, the 70s, when we had a lot of <clears throat> leaders coming and going violently. Um, but that segment of the population is going away. And I think that explains the violence you have in Uganda today because uh, the NRM used to count a lot on the rural segment of the population. That used to be their strength. But the last elections in Uganda, the, the midterm elections, um, the by-election, sorry, of the uh, members of parliament, which they have lost to the opposition, I think have sent shockwaves throughout the NRM that the demographics of the country are no longer in their favor. Like the times of telling this generation stories of the past, that we fought the war, we came to save you, we liberated the country. Those stories they have used to convince voters, especially in rural Uganda, to vote for them are no longer resonating with the majority of Uganda, especially the demographics talked about of the young population. So I believe that's really sending shockwaves. That's why you see the reaction you're seeing on Bobby Wine and other opposition leaders locking them up, charging them with treason. They're coming to terms with the reality of this generation, which is pushing them out, saying we need change, we need democracy, we need power change. 
Because at the moment, any time you get into power, it becomes tempting. I don't know if the people behind him who are benefiting from the regime, who don't want him to go. The hunger. The exactly. Hunger zone. That, that's the theory which has been put out there, that maybe the, the man is tired, but the people are urging him to stay. But where so, does the back stop? Until death, it seems. Who do you think and, uh, puts those hungers on in those positions? They don't put themselves there. Right. Right. So uh, at the moment right But now, I think it should also be a collective responsibility, especially right. of the elite. Right. Especially when you look at uh, the institution of parliament, for example, really. Yeah. President Yoweri Museveni himself, frankly, has publicly said he does not care about the quality of the individual right. who goes to that August House. Right. So long as when his bill comes up, right. he's able to support it. And we have seen it in Uganda Parliament time and time again, recently with the social media bill, which uh, they were taxing social media and the internet and mobile money. Most of the members of Parliament had no idea what they were voting for. They had no idea what actually the significance of taxing social media is. They don't really actually understand the impact of internet in society. We live in the age where you can create a small business tomorrow and just going on Facebook and create the, your website and uh, market your company. But our government sees this as, he called it Lugambo. As so where is, where is patriotism when we need it? Are these legislators not in fact patriotic to their stomachs? The stomachs of their families and friends? I think it becomes a career. It has become a career for many. And I don't want to say it's only Uganda, but we also see politicians here in D.C. Mm. making it a career. Right. So they just think about that paycheck. How do I right. survive? How do I stay in parliament for 20 or 30 years? By the so, way, I should take this uh, opportunity to apologize to the audience because uh, I sort of uh, misled them right. by saying that uh, Yoweri Museveni asked his supporters or voters to give him three, to give him another opportunity to serve his second and last constitutional allowable term in 2021 i actually meant 2001 All right 2001 All right uh, that's what i meant and when we go back to those three things right. the fact of the matter that uh, he probably accomplished uh, the professionalizing of the army right. and besides he doesn't necessarily to be the one to do that anyway but, and he probably also may have accomplished securing a regional economic market because the last time I checked, you do have the East African community in place. Right. But what about the third and most important, choosing a successor? Right. Did he choose himself? That's the dilemma. That's the dilemma. And that's why I think you have seen people like our mama and babas get frustrated and leaving. Mugisha Muntu getting frustrated and leaving, Kiza Besige getting frustrated and leaving. I think that whole generation of leaders also believed that at some point Museven will give way. But those were in. also some of the people who probably uh, helped him, as a matter of fact. Yes. Because yes. when you talk about uh, my brother, Amama Mbawazi, right. uh, he was probably one of those people that was in the front line right. of championing uh, the idea of a Yoweri Museveni who was uniquely gifted right. and therefore should be given an exception. Right. He probably no longer thinks that way. Right. Now, Absolutely. Jeff, talk to me about um, the international uh, perspective, for example. What can the international community do, really, to help the people of Uganda, to help free the people of Africa? You know, t to be honest, I think this all goes back to the conversation you were just having. It's, a, it's a, I think, a large factor in this entire equation is regional leadership, or the lack thereof, uh, on the African continent. If you were talking about some ex-presidents who've, who've come out recently and been a bit forceful on these issues. I and can't I, wait I can count to on air one that hand, interview with Bakiri Bulusi. Yeah, I can count on one hand maybe some ex-presidents who, who have spoken out forcefully. Former Botswanan uh, President Festus Mohai. Uh, you've had former President Chisano in Mozambique. Um, recently, Obasanjo in Nigeria. But there's a very few. Probably still in Botswana, even here in Kama. 
it in is common. A comma, yeah, yeah. And a comma. Exactly. And I think I think sort of circling back to the the way in which you started the show, perhaps we need more Kofi Annans in this world. Although he wasn't a head of state, you know, he wasn't uh, he never hesitated to speak truth to power. Uh, your your first guest was talking about the Iraq war where he came out very forcefully and said this is an illegal intervention. Precisely. He spoke truth to power to the United States and to Britain, which led that illegal, now disastrous He did that, and of course, he was victimized. Exactly, and he was victimized for that. So, and I think the other point, too, I, I think is really important to raise is so often leaders like Museveni um, try to externalize the, the, these issues. They try to say the West or the United States is trying to impose their values on us, and they, they say this is all about Western finger-wagging. But if you look at the African Union Charter on Democracy, mm. it's all laid out very clearly right, right there. Right. Uh, it got off to a slow start, but I now believe there are, are 26 countries that have actually signed and ratified the AU Charter on Democracy mm. and Elections. Mm. You mentioned you were recently in Southern Africa. Mm. They have the static principles and guidelines governing democratic elections. And you mentioned Zimbabwe. Look at their recent election on July 30. And I, I, I dare anyone to take a look at those principles and guidelines and, and point to, to one that met. The, the criteria that the own mm. region has set out for what determines a free, fair, and credible election. I think that the service that has been done is particularly around election time is that, um, particularly in the African context, is free, fair, and credible is now somehow equivalent to peaceful. If an election was peaceful and orderly on election day, then it gets the rubber stamp of the African Union, it gets the rubber stamp of regional institutions. But and Jeff, what about some people who say a lot of these democratically challenged African countries when they organize the elections, they are frankly not organizing these elections for right. the primary stakeholder, who is the citizen. Right. Rather, they are organizing these elections for the development partners. Well, I think, I, I think that's um, certainly there's an argument to be made for that. But I think also, um, you know, I, I think we, sure, we certainly should applaud um, the fact that multi-party democracy is now the expected norm, that right. elections now are the norm. What, but what people, uh, particularly leaders who've been in power for decades at a time, what they've very cleverly done is hold elections that appear credible on a surface level. But if you begin pe peeling back the layers, again, Zimbabwe is a great These example. These are selections. They're not they were, elections. Exactly. They're fundamentally flawed hmm? from the very outset. And I think but what about the fact that uh, the behavior, for example, of some of these leaders on the continent, frankly, a lot of people think they should not really be regarded as leaders because they don't behave as leaders. Mm. They should be called what they are, which is rulers. Right. That these people are really nyamparas, especially, of Western foreign policy. Right. Nyampara is a Swahili word meaning headman, mm. meaning someone who essentially puts the natives in place and supports whatever the West wants to do, whether it is anti-terrorism policies or whatever it is. And so long as he's able to do that, their Western partners will definitely support them no matter what. Right. When it comes to misbehaving in terms of interacting with their own populations, the Western leaders will look the other way. Right. You know, I, I think it's important, I think, really quickly to a lot of this has been sort of focusing on some of the backsliding taking place. but Un Unfortunately. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I was going to say, focus on some of the positive as well. We mentioned Prime yeah. Minister Abiy okay. in Ethiopia as one example to sort of... A new bleed of African it. leaders. Could that be exactly. the one? Yeah. Really? Yeah. Not the other ones, uh, you know, at least uh, by the Clinton administration. Well, on that note, uh, our guests today are Dr. Daniel Kauma, Jeffrey Smith, Stephanie Dujaric, and Mildred to Haise, Ugandan Ambassador Mar Sebuja Katende, who will not join us due to scheduling conflict. Thanks to our field stations, along with our viewers and listeners. For many of our Voice of America radio affiliates, learning English is coming up next. And tomorrow morning, it's Daybreak Africa with James Bate. On behalf of the Voice of America, thanks for tuning into Straight Talk Africa. In the meantime, get better, not better, Uganda. And please remember to keep the African hopes alive. <laughs>